helping. My name's Dr. Mark um, Winnetong and my mob's Cubby Cubby. Um, as well as that, we have South Sion from Vanuatu in us. And um, so I've been working up in North Queensland for the last 10 years or so, um, both in um, the urban sort of centres and, and rural and remote. Uh, look, to be honest, my journey in health started with my mother, with my mother's journey into health. So um, she was one of the first uh, Aboriginal health workers in Queensland in the um, Aboriginal health program when it started here. So got trained as a health worker very, very early on. And, um, and I kind of um, was working in laboratories at the time in pathology. And um, when she started doing that, and, and plus, you know, we'd get all the um, pathology samples from Cape, Taurus, everywhere else, you know, um, and, um, and I could see how bad the um, disease profile was and, you know, that there were a lot of, a lot of issues there. And um, um, so that made me want to do more. And I knew as a path technician, I couldn't really do that much. I couldn't be that influential. So it was kind of either, you know, law or medicine if I really wanted to make a difference. And, um, um, and medicine was a lot close to me because I've been working in pathology. And, and plus, I think because um, uh, my mother had already kind of pushed me down that track a bit. So I'd, I used to sit in on the um, health worker training in Brisbane when she was down there. <laughs> I was 16 or 15 or 16 at the time, but um, um, I was going along to the AHP kind of training um, um, workshops um, with her. So, um, and just picking up bits and pieces as I went along. So it kind of started with um, my mother and, and probably same for lots of us, you know, we kind of rest on the shoulders of our old people who um, did it really hard um, compared to how we do it today. So, yeah. Yeah, I've already spoken to some health workers who've had a really similar story, actually. It started out inspired by the people in their family who had entered the workforce. It must have given you a really good insight into Aboriginal health workforce and Torres Strait Islander workforce and how we do things differently. What sorts of things did you learn early on about what differentiates the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce? Um, lots of fun. <laughs> um, um, the training program was a blast and, you know, like it was just full of humour and real relationships and, and, and things like that. And, um, and I, I guess back then I, I really wasn't thinking about where I was going to end up um, um, later in life, but um, it sure gave me some good insights into um, um, over that period of time the needs, um, and then what kind of a workforce that we we did need in the space, um, and plus that during that time um, um, I had um, had a, a, a kind of a, a chronic um, vomiting illness. So it's a migraine, my, from migraines. But um, um, but often when I go into the local emergency department, they just assume I'd been drinking too much and um, didn't drink at all then. And um, so they shut me out the back and um, not seen me till the next day <laughs> um, uh, because I thought I was lying about drinking. And um, um, so it gave me some real insights into, wow, um, we need to change this system. And um, um, and um, I, I worked in that hospital. <laughs> so, um, um, so if I'm thinking, man, if it's that hard for me at different times, um, how much is it for my brothers and sisters who come in from remote communities and, and you know really struggle with language and a whole lot of other things and technology? Um, so um, those things kind of shape this kind of career uh, progression. And, and having said that, look, you know most of the ERs are fantastically good now in Australia um, compared to what they were back in the day, um, but it certainly wasn't a great experience to the extent that I said I'd rather stay home and stay sick than. Um, and turn up to an emergency department again. So um, that shaped um, some of that. Um, it, it taught me what not to be like and what not to do and um, showed me what kind of practitioner I really wanted to be if I ever, you know, um, got that far. So um, so those things, I think, all shaped, um, all shaped my um, journey a fair bit. Yeah, shared a lot of similar experiences again to what I've heard and kind of pointed to this unfair burden that our... First Nations health workers have to carry when they're in the system, especially in mainstream services. So what for you then is the importance of having this national day of recognition for our health workforce? Uh, look, I think it's fantastic. Um, there's a number of reasons. One I think is that um, um, historically and culturally, um, we have a long tradition of healing and of traditional healers and healers in our community. So that's not that big a step for us to move into health um, from a Western um, paradigm as well. And, um, and to be doing the things that we were meant to be doing, which is taking care of each other. You know? So, um, um, so for me, that was a bit of a no brainer, but, um, um, but I think 
being able now to celebrate where we've come to. And, and look, we've, we've done a lot in a very short period of time. And, and there's a number of reasons, I think, um, for that. One is um, at a collegiate kind of um, national level, all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health peaks work together. Like there's kind of been, ever since I've been involved in this gig, there's never been this doctors versus nurses versus health workers versus allied health versus pharmacy. Um, and, um, and you do see that in, um, in um, the, the, how, other, how mainstream approaches things. Um, but for us, it was always um, patient about the patients um, for all of our peaks, and and I hope we always continue to work that way. And that's one of the things that I think that makes our um, professional workforce fantastic, is that um, we're all there for the right reason and pretty much for the same reason. Um, so that means that we can um, um, articulate our programs and what we're doing at a national level um, without fighting with each other, um, but with with but staying consistent, you know, and knowing that at the end of the day, the strategy isn't just about our organisation surviving or anything like that. The strategy is about us taking care of our communities the way that we're supposed to um, and being the, um, the, those links in the health chain um, to ensure that our mob get good services and um, continue to get um, even better services. So while we've developed um, fairly good in the health workforce, I think there'll be lots of us now who will be moving into both policy practice and, and um, research um, with very good heads um, on our shoulders because we really know what the issues are at the coalface. So, um, so I'm looking forward to more and more um, influence um, from our mob in the health sector, but um, overall throughout the health sector. How critical are our health workers and health practitioners in our public health responses? Um, um, look, once again, um, if, if you want to look at a good public health response, you don't need to go any further than the COVID response and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, and the fact that we've done probably better than any other group in the world um, as, a, as a population group um, in that. And that's due to a number of things, um, um, just our communities and our communities um, practicing self-determination. Um, and uh, making those kind of choices about closing off and opening up themselves. Um, but as well as that, we have this kind of whole workforce of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that really do understand the differences between, you know, a broader um, generic public health approach and um, how things really work in our communities, you know. So, for instance, those ads around, you know, keeping your distance from other people. Um, when our mob came up with, you know, you know about, this, about the length of a granny's walking stick when she's angry at you um and um and you know things like you know when the prime minister said oh it's okay for family groups to go walking walking now and we go no not <laughs> he's talking about four people not 20 <laughs> um but um and and you know the the um the the kind of um home and social infrastructure that's available to our mob to be able to um respond to these things was a lot less um so we had to retranslate everything into terms and and ways um, for that kind of response that our communities could understand. And health workers were the front end of that, um, including doing um, translation into language, um, uh, et cetera, all the way through. And, um, and I think pretty much all of our peaks, you know, as health professionals were involved in some way in this, in whether it was um, educating our own workforces and, and getting them out there, or um, um, just being in a, in, in a very sustained, um, 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 systematic kind of response um, and um, and we kind of all hung together and and, and sang from the same songbook um, as opposed to you know states and territories and feds who, who kind of let politics kind of come into that um, but for us it was always once again about well how do we protect our communities from this the best and um, who's available and who's here and um, um, you know um, so it's I think that's a full credit to our health workforce and I think it's partly because we know our communities well um, they're not just kind of patients to us, they're relations, they're friends, they're family. Um, and even if they're not, they are, if you know what I mean. Um, so um, we try and take care. And, um, and that means a much more holistic approach than just telling people, well, we'll go down the road and get a vaccine down there kind of thing. This is, this is much more um, intuitive. And, and when I say intuitive, I mean, you know, you might ask the average health worker whether they're practicing culturally or not. No, they are. I just do what I do. Um, but at the end of the day, they're intuitive 
very practicing cultural cultural ways and um and always will you know um so that's the kind of practice that needs to be encouraged in australia's health system um and the way of taking care of people that should be kind of um, expanded throughout the uh, mainstream health system as well they want to do a lot better it feels like maybe for the first time the rest of the country has actually gotten to see really closely and quickly just how effective our health services are and our community is at responding to these issues because we've well, always known. Well, there's that. Um, and I think, you know, there's a couple of other things that I think are key learnings in this as well. One is, as I was saying, um, our communities themselves made a lot of the decisions around this and pushed a lot of things from a policy perspective. Um, you think that, um, that governments and politicians and bureaucrats could now start trusting us a bit more in broad self-determination because, you know, if we can have that kind of an outcome when you do listen to us about what we think the solutions are and the ways forward, um, maybe we could solve Aboriginal affairs um, a lot more easily if you listen to us in the same way. And I think it's a good exemplar of that. Yeah, we've got the blueprint ready to go, hey? <laughs> <laughs>